Welcome to Mountain View. Thanks for joining us today. Whether you're new or this is your church home, you can find everything you need to know about Mountain View on our hub at mtnvw.org slash hub. There you'll find info about giving, life groups, and kids. If you're new or have a prayer request, make sure to click the connect button. Stay in touch during the week by following us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Before service starts, we want to give you an idea about what to expect. We will begin by singing a few songs together with the purpose of glorifying God through praise and worship. The lyrics will be displayed and we invite everyone to sing along. Following our songs, one of our teaching pastors will share a message about the good news in a relatable way with the hope of growing our faith and understanding of God. Finally, we will take communion and sing again in a response to God's goodness. Whether online or in person, we are so glad you're here today. Let's get ready to worship. Hey, welcome friends. Did you, did you bring a voice to testify today? Come on friends. We invite you to stand. Whether it's your first time joining us or you're part of our family, I invite you to sing these words as you know them. Sing it out. I saw Satan fall like lightning. I saw darkness run for cover. But the miracle that I just can't get over My name is registered in heaven I believe, say I believe in signs and wonders I have resurrection power Yes, I do it Still the miracle that I just can't get over My name is registered in heaven Yeah, my praise belongs to you forever this is my testimony from death to life because grace rewrote my story i'll testify by jesus christ the righteous i'm justified this is my testimony this is my testimony Testimony Church, lift up these words too. Shout it out, say, Come together, sons and daughters, bought with blood and washed in water. Sing the praises of the Spirit, Son and Father, our God, who finished what He started. Say it again. Oh, our God, will finish what He started. My testimony from death to life. Grace rewrote my story. I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. And our testimony is our witness to Him. Amen. All He's done in our lives, friends. Let's declare these words together. If I'm not dead, then you're not done. And greater things still to come. Oh, I believe. If I'm not dead, then you're not done. And greater things still to come. Oh, I believe. Sing it. If I'm not dead, then you're not done. No, no, no. Greater things still to come. Oh, I believe if I'm not dead, then you're not done. And greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe. We believe this is our testimony. Say, this is my testimony from death to life. Because grace rewrote my story. I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. Oh, I'm alive. This is my testimony from death to life. Cause grace rewrote my story. I'll testify. By Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. Amen. 
church? Yeah. Amen. That's all right. You can give it to him. Yeah. Come on. God, we're here to take a new step in our faith and love in your son, Jesus, through your Holy Spirit. Won't you sing with me, church? This is our journey. Sometimes on this journey, I get lost in my mistakes. What looks to me like weakness is a canvas for your strength. And my story isn't over, my story's just begun. And fear you won't define me, cause that's what my father does. Sing it again. Fear you won't define me, cause that's what my father does. Sing it. your shame at the door cause it ain't welcome anymore Ooh, you're in my father's house hey. let's center our hearts and minds on him yeah church you went home too arrival's not the end game Say, arrival's not the end game the journey's where you are you never want it perfect, you just want it my heart. And the story isn't over, if the story isn't good. And failure's never final when the father's in. That's our redemption. Failure's never final when the father's in our room. these words if you believe prodigals come home the helpless find hope cause love is on the move when the father's in the room say prison doors fling wide the dead come to life love is on the move when the father's in the room miracles say miracles take place Some beautiful singing, friends. He's loving it. Come on. But let's do more than sing, friends. Let's worship Him in spirit and truth. Would you confess these words with me? This is your story. God, I'm on my knees again. God, I'm begging, please again. I need you. Oh, I need you. And walking down these desert roads Water for my thirsty soul I need you Oh, I need you Your forgiveness
words to hidden church. So take me to the riverside. Take me under baptize. I need you. Oh God, I need you. Oh, your forgiveness. My sweet, sweet honey on my lips. Like the sound of a symphony to my ears. It's like holy water on my skin. Holy water. Baptized. family declare it. Father, we give this day to you, wherever we are on our journey, whether we're taking our first step or we've been traveling for miles with you. Father, we ask that you challenge us today in your spirit and in your truth, that you can speak into our hearts and our minds and take us on that next step with you, walking alongside us with Jesus as our guide, as we follow him. And sometimes that can be scary. Sometimes it's into the unknown. Sometimes it's darkness we're walking into. But Father, if we have faith that you're with us and that your love endures forever, we will walk with confidence. So challenge us today. And Father, we ask that you bless our tithes and our offerings as that is an act of worship. Worship is so much more than singing. We love to sing. But Father, every step that we take is worshiping you. Every movement and everything that comes out of our mouths can be worshiped to you. So let us focus our hearts and minds on you now in your son's name. Amen. Amen. If you give online or in person, your giving provides care and support to people within our church community. Train Stevens ministers provide Christ-centered care to people experiencing challenges. Meals are delivered to families in need and workshops are offered on topics ranging from grief to depression. You can give by going to mtnvw.org slash give, texting the amount to the number on the screen, or by mail to 40 East Highlands Ranch Parkway. Thank you for your caring spirit. As Christians, it's pretty well known that we're supposed to spread the gospel. We tend to shift our focus a little bit. So I encourage you guys, if you're one of the people who are getting caught up in likes and all that, just don't get caught up in that. There's so many more ways to spread the gospel.
Hello, Mountain View family. We're glad that you're joining us today. How's everybody doing? Good. Hi, everybody watching us at home, online, wherever you are. We're so glad that you're here with us on this awesome Sunday as we continue this series that we're in called More Than Likes. Now, before we get started, I just want to say those teenagers in that video are not just a bunch of randos. Those are our kids. Those are our teenagers from this church. Two of them were on the stage today in the band, which I think is really awesome. Let's give it up for our awesome teenagers who get to be a part of what we do here in this space, I think that's really, really important. I'm so glad um, that they are a part of our band and all the cool stuff that we do here. We're in a series. This series is called More Than Likes. You might be asking yourself, what does this have to do with anything? And it's a very, very good question. For those of you who don't know, likes are a thing that you receive as a reward for posting something that a bunch of randos enjoy. You typically find it on social media pages. The like button has morphed over years to become a lot of things. Now I think you can do like a thumbs down or you could do like a sad face or hugs or hard. It's like a bunch of things. But what started as a thumbs up communicated to you that a picture that you posted of your dog or your food or your kid or all of the above was worthy of a thumbs up. That's what a like is. And what happened when likes started to become a thing in social media, people started living for likes. It was this idea that you would constantly be scrolling on your phone, just waiting for people to like what you did or to like what you said, and you would be there all the time just watching it over and over and over again. Now, I don't know where you are with social media, if you use social media or if you've kind of <laughs> let it go over the last year, I totally understand. I'm not a huge social media user, but I do know what it is like to be living for the approval of others. Living for likes is very similar. This idea that you want people to like you, you want people to enjoy or appreciate the things that you post in a social media platform. The purpose of this message, uh, this series that we're in right now is simply to say we have to live for more than likes. We have, there's gotta be more to life than living for the approval of others. What does it look like to take it beyond a like to something else? If you were here last week or you watched online last week and you got to hear Charles open up our sermon series, this idea of going beyond just casual relationships or tolerating people and investing in genuine relationships. Now, I wasn't actually in the room when it happened, but I heard that he proposed to someone. Is that right? Is that what I heard? Is that the rumor? We should start a rumor. All right. <laughs> He's going to be so mad at me for that. All right, so that was last week, all right? This idea that we have to be more than just that. It has to move beyond toleration to actually investing in real relationships. Now, next week, Ken is going to come and wrap up the series as we talk about what genuine community looks like. And today, we're going to talk about something that's really, really important. If we want to be about more than likes, we have to become intentional in every facet of what we do. And today we're going to talk about a really, really important facet of what we do as the church, as the body of believers, and that's justice. Biblical justice. Now maybe you hear that word and all of a sudden it got real quiet. Uh-oh. Maybe that's a trigger or a buzzword for you. Something you've probably heard a lot about over the last year or so. Maybe you're not 100% sure how to feel about it, what to do, what the Bible says about it, which is what we're going to talk about today. But we're going to talk about biblical justice because we have to. We're going to talk about biblical justice because justice is all throughout the Bible that you're going to come to see today. In fact, we're going to start with a story from the book of 3 John. It's a letter that John wrote. It's kind of a tiny book. I don't know that I would call it a book as much as I would call it a letter. It doesn't even have a chapter. It's just a bunch of verses, kind of like a page and a half in your Bible. We're going to start with a story that is the catalyst for our conversation about biblical justice today. Now, we're going to start in 3 John, but then I'm going to be all over the map. And most of you said, yeah, what else is new, Phil? But I am. I'm going to be all over the map today, hitting all these different passages, because I want you to see how the whole story, all 66 books, the whole story of the Bible points to this idea and necessity for justice. But I want us to be clear about what that means and looks like in our modern context. So if you have your Bibles, we are in 3 John, starting at verse 9. Let me set up a little bit of a context of what's happening here. There is a man. So John is writing to this man, and he's writing about a bunch of different things. And then we get to verse 9, and he starts talking about this tension that he's having, John is having, by a man by the name of Diotrephes. 
And so he goes on to this whole, it's kind of a rant a little bit, John does in verses nine and following, about this man Diotrephes, who's a leader in the church, and some awful things that Diotrephes did. And this is, how, this is where we begin with John in verse nine of third John. He says this, I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to be first, will not welcome us. So when I come, I will call attention to what he is doing, spreading malicious nonsense about us. Not satisfied with that, he even refuses to welcome other believers. He also stops those who want to do so and puts them out of the church. Whew, drama. Diotrephes was doing a lot of not great things. First of all, he was refusing to welcome missionaries. Okay, John had sent some missionaries to this particular church and they get there and he refuses to welcome them in or treat them with any hospitality. Culturally speaking, that is a giant slap in the face to John. It's personally offensive and it's culturally inappropriate. If someone were to come to your house, you would welcome them as a family member. They'd no longer become strangers. The fact that Diotrephes did this and stood in the way of hospitality to missionaries is deeply offensive to John, as you can tell by his words. Diotrephes had a position of leadership in the church, and apparently he loved to be first, as John points out. And this is a very serious problem because as a leader in a church, we tend to be last. We're supposed to be last and not first. We are servants, not the ones in charge. Christ is the head of the church. The man loved being the leader, and he loved exercising his authority over people. So John basically says in this moment, oh, when I get there, we're going to have a come to Jesus <laughs> about all the things that you're doing, Diotrephes. This is not going to be okay. You're prideful. You're self-interested. You're a gossiper. You've refused to be hospitable to missionaries that I sent to you. You've prevented other people from being hospitable to those same missionaries. You've attempted to remove people from the church when they tried to be hospitable. And none of this is acceptable for a leader in the church. It's not okay. That is the context for what John is about to say next in verse 11. He says all of these things about this man Diotrephes and all the awful ways, and we're going to call out a bad actor when we see them. And then he says this in verse 11, Dear friend, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. Anyone who does what is good is from God. Anyone who does what is evil has not seen God. I want to draw your attention for a minute to something very important here. There's these, these phrases that come in this verse, does what is good, does what is evil. It's actually the same Greek word used for both. It's where we get our English word for mimic. It's imitate. It's mimic. Do not mimic evil. Diotrephes was mimicking evil even though he was a leader in the church. What you're supposed to do is mimic good. The point John makes here is clear. The person who does good proves with his actions, not just his words, that God is the center and the source of his life. And a person who mimics evil has not moved into a position of Christ being the center of their lives. This is like the age-old phrase, actions speak louder than words. They did back then, they still do now. The right words and the wrong actions never end well. Diotrephes is a great example of this because he was a leader within the church, and that did not happen by accident. He didn't just stumble on becoming a leader. He probably said all of the right things. He probably said all of the right things and had people convinced that he was good, but his actions were mimicking evil. And John wanted to point out, this is how you can tell the difference. It's not in what they say, it's in what they do. And that's really important for us as Christians, because as Christians, we are supposed to be mimickers of what is good, imitators of what is good. As children of God, we should be imitating the Son of God. Now, let me tell you what that means. It means a couple of things for us, two things. First of all, it means that we have to be aware of whom we are looking to as our source and our inspiration. Who is it that we are mimicking? The answer to that should always be Christ Jesus. He's the one that we are called to imitate and to mimic. Who is it that we are looking to for our inspiration? And at the same time, having to realize and be aware of who is looking at us the answer to that part is the world, our world. 
So while we mimic Christ and look to Christ for that kind of inspiration, that holy inspiration, we also have to be aware that the rest of the world is watching us. They're watching what we say. They're mostly watching what we do, or maybe even more importantly, what we don't do. They're watching. And they're making assumptions and judgment calls about us, which leads us to the conversation that we need to have today about biblical justice. Biblical justice. Is God calling us to do more? I want to take a minute to set the scene for you about biblical justice. I'm going to draw. I didn't say it was going to be good, but I'm going to draw. Because I want you to have a visual idea of what we're talking about when we talk about this idea and this concept of justice. I think the best place for us to start is at the beginning and the foundation. The foundation of the building blocks that we're going to put together in biblical justice is God. God is the foundation of justice. In fact, in both the Old and New Testaments, when you see God described in the Bible, typically three words come in a a section together. God is loving, God is righteous, and God is just. Loving, righteous, and just. You will have a hard time finding a description for God that doesn't include one or all three of those words. Literally, God is the source and the foundation of justice. That's a really, really important thing to keep in mind. He is loving, he is righteous, and our God is a just God. This isn't something that the world made up. God is the foundation. It's how he's described. God is the foundation of justice. Now, in the Old Testament, if someone broke the law, they should be and oftentimes were punished in a manner befitting to the crime they committed. So this is where we get the concept of an eye for an eye. The idea that if someone takes your eye out, then you have the right to get even and gouge out their eye. Justice. Aren't we glad that that's not where justice ended? Because if that were truth, we would all be blind. In fact, we probably would have run out of eyes a long time ago. But that was the idea, an eye for an eye. You did this to me, I get to do this back to you. That's fair. That's just. But in the New Testament, a shift happens. A concept of justice shifts from this idea of eye for an eye mentality to an attitude of this inner transformation that moves us beyond our actions or our inactions. In other words, justice becomes internalized for the believer because of Jesus Christ. So now, instead of asking God, God, what is it that I, that how should this person repay me for the wrongs that they have done to me? Instead of that being the question, the question now becomes, God, break my heart for what breaks yours. Do you hear the shift? The only reason that shift is possible is because of Christ Jesus. Which leads us to the second part of our building blocks. The foundation of justice is God. But then you got to ask yourself, why justice at all? Why? Why do we need justice? And the answer is easy. You. Me. We are the why behind justice. Humankind. Humankind, God's most sacred and prized possession, is the why behind the justice. God created us in his image as we read in the Old Testament, and he saw that it was very good. Of all the things that God created, we are his most sacred and most prized possession because we are a reflection of the creator. And in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, God shows very deep concern for humans and the issues that we deal with, issues that we created, by the way, but he feels very deep concern for the issues we deal with. And because we are his most sacred and most prized possession, this is where we get the idea of the sanctity of human life. It's sacred and precious because God has made us sacred and precious. So human life, human dignity, human flourishing, these are the why behind justice. These are the why behind justice. And now to Jesus who is kind of the centerpiece of this whole thing. In the Sermon on the Mount, a powerful, powerful couple of chapters in the New Testament, Jesus makes it clear that obedience to God goes beyond following the rules. 
It's beyond following the rules, but that you seek to put on an interesting phrase, the mind of Christ. You seek to put on the mind of Christ in everything that you say and everything that you do. And I want you to think about that phrase for a minute, what it means to put on the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ, the same Christ who entered into a community and entered into relationships with outcasts, tax collectors, lepers, women, people of different ethnicities. Put on the mind of Christ, the same mind of Christ who forgave those who were unforgivable and decided that those who had wronged him don't have to pay for it. That same mind of Christ. Jesus Christ introduces this new concept of justice into the world. And this new concept that he introduces is this idea of the need to make things right, to make things right. This is a concept you actually see throughout the Bible. But one of the things you're going to start to realize about biblical justice that maybe separates it a little bit from our cultural understanding of justice is that biblical justice is always in the context of a relationship. Literally, the whole story of the Bible is about relationship, a broken relationship between God and man. And God, through all of these stories of the Bible, trying to make things right with us trying to reset the broken things with us. It always starts, justice always starts with relationship. Our relationship to God and making things right, our relationship to others in making things right. Jesus talks about this idea when he's asked about what the greatest commandment is in the Gospel book of Matthew. You can find the story in Matthew 22, 37, and 40. People say, what, what, teacher, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus replies, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. A commandment, by the way, which you find in the Old Testament was a law given to God through Moses. And then Jesus adds to it and says, the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. And then he makes this huge proclamation. All of the law and all of the prophets hang on these two commandments. All of the law, all of the prophets is the majority of the Old Testament. All of those things hang on those two things. Now, oftentimes we read that. You've probably heard that a million times and think to yourself, yep, I get it. Love God, love others, check, done. Put it on a t-shirt, thumbs up. But here's the reality. We hear that, and we think at some context we understand what that means. But here's the caution. We have to be careful not to define love on our own terms. Because when we do that, we risk thinking that we're loving others, when in reality we're just doing what we want to do. And those are two very, very different things. How many of you guys have ever heard of the concept of love languages? It's kind of a thing that's gone around. You probably, you know, it's like quality time and something else. Okay, so like love languages, kind of a, a common thing that's been around for a while. Can you imagine a world where your spouse says to you, my love languages are quality time and physical touch? And your response to her is, yeah, that's not really my thing. So will you settle for a gift once a year and a pat on the back? Love ya. Can you imagine a world where you would ever do such a thing? At some point in the context of relationship, you have to learn to humble yourself and to love people the way that they want and need to be loved. It's for this reason that in some cultures, it's appropriate to bow when greeting someone as opposed to shaking their hand. Or for why you take your shoes off before entering someone's house. Or why you remove your hat before you pray. These are signs of deep respect and honor, which translates to different cultures as love. This is true in every facet of all of our relationships. Our marriage, our familial relationships with our kids. All of the things. Our friendships. You don't just love people the way you think it should be done and just hope they're okay with that. You learn to love people where they're at. You learn to love people the way they need to receive love. That's part of it. That requires work. That requires humbling yourself. That requires submitting to someone else in the name of love. So we read love God and we read love others and we think easy peasy, but it's not as easy as it sounds on paper. It takes work, it takes effort, and it's hard, and we don't always get it right. That's what love is, and that's what love does. 
That's what love does. We've talked already about the foundation of justice. We've talked about the why of justice. Now, I want to talk about the who of justice. Who specifically are we talking about when we talk about justice? Because obviously we understand humankind and the sanctity of life, but that's a lot of us. Is there in, did anyone say anything specific about all of humankind that we really should be focusing our attention on? Good question. The answer is Jesus did, and you find it in the book of Matthew. Here's what's interesting about this concept of justice. We are not the first people on planet Earth to experience a world filled with injustices, and we are not the first people to not notice them all the time. I think that's part of the reason why Jesus made a habit of pointing out things to people that maybe they hadn't seen or they hadn't noticed before. I think that's why Jesus spent so much of his ministry on earth helping people who everyone else had dismissed and forgot about in an effort to help everyone else see the world through his eyes. You find a moment like this in the Gospel book of Matthew again. In this particular encounter, Jesus was comparing the righteous people to the unrighteous people and this is what he says in Matthew 25, verse 34 through 40. He says this, Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you, will, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink and so on and so on? And then the king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, there's the key word, you did for me. Did you catch that? Jesus was saying that people who choose to do good and want to help others are people who see and look for injustice around them. They care about a group of people that Jesus calls the least of these, which sometimes is hard to define. So let me clarify it for you because there was a giant list there. But the least of these doesn't stop at the examples that Jesus gave. The least of these are those who need the most help, those who feel the most pain, those who get the worst treatment. Those are the least of these among us. And in every community, in every part of the globe, there are the least of these among us. So what this means, what Jesus is saying, is those who recognize someone who's hungry or in prison or sick or left out, that we do something about it. We see the injustice in the way those least of these are treated. We see the injustice in their circumstances, and we care about it, and we act on it, and we do something about it. And here's the why. Because when we care for those who are being treated as less than or left out, we are showing that our God cares about them and that our God loves them. Surprisingly or not surprisingly, justice has very little to do with you and about the God that loves you and wants you to demonstrate that love to others. Let's review for just a second. We have God as the basis in our foundation. And then we have the why of justice. Why? Because you, because humans, because of the sanctity of life, the high value that God puts on us. But that's a lot of folks. Who are we talking about specifically? Jesus says the least of these among us. That's the who. Now we get to a very, very important part, the top of our little tower here. It's the how. It's the how of justice. This is the action. This is the action part of justice. And I want to point out something here, and I'm going to point it out with a line. Because this is where justice becomes unnecessarily controversial. We agree with everything below that line. As Christians, we agree with all of this. This is biblical, foundational. You can find it in your own Bibles. Look for yourself. Don't take my word for it. You can find all of these things, a precedent for this. Then we get to this. 
And my guess is no two people in this room agree about the how. That's my guess. We're going to have different thoughts, different opinions, different ideologies about how we accomplish justice from things like social justice, racial justice, basic human rights. Do we use money, laws, social protections, safety nets, politics? How? How? Here's what you need to hear me say. Don't let this disrupt what God put together. Don't let the culture rob us of our biblical imperative to justice. Can this be divisive? Absolutely. If you dismiss all of justice because we can't agree about this, then we are not doing what God has called us to do. Don't dismiss it. Look at all that we agree on. We have so much more in common than we disagree. As Christ's representatives on earth, we have a call to biblical justice. So to do nothing is to communicate to the world that God doesn't care about them, which is a lie. It's a lie. And lies are an imitation of evil. It's mimicking evil. And we have been called to mimic good. So here's the reality about justice. Sometimes, because there's a biblical imperative for it, sometimes justice may require punishment for our inaction or our misdeeds in an effort to remind people, specifically God's people, of what is expected of them. Sometimes justice is going to mean punishment. But here's what you need to hear me say. That kind of justice is not the same thing as being canceled. Being canceled implies that you're guilty and that's the end of the story. But those of us who are grace-filled, spirit-led, Christ-believing people know that you can be guilty and loved and forgiven in the same breath. Sometimes justice means that those who are the least of these among us need some equity, need some help, They need some equitable treatment within the community. That's not the same thing as being woke. Being woke is drawing attention to a thing, being aware of the injustices around us, which is a start. But being grace-filled, spirit-led, Christ-centric people moves us beyond awareness to action. To action. Here's the thing. There's a lot going on in our world, always. I think maybe it feels super concentrated right now because we've all been home for a year. But there was a lot going on in our world before the pandemic. There's a lot going in our, in our country, and a lot of it was going on well before the events of the last year. Hearing things like this, maybe you get all the feels. I know I do. Maybe you get the feeling of this idea of just being burned out of doing good. I'm just burned out. I, can't, I, I don't even know. There's just so much. Maybe you're convinced that there's just too much evil in this world. There's, just, it, there's nothing we can do about it. It's just too much. We just should pray for the Lord Jesus to come and call it a day. And I pray. Trust me. I pray. What is my good going to do to fix or change anything? What, what is it going to do? I get it. Maybe some of you are angered by the injustice that goes on in our world. I've been there too. Maybe some of you are angry because you feel like we're always the ones that have to fall on the sword. It's always us, all the time. We always have to submit. We always have to be the ones to say, I'm sorry. We always have to extend the olive branch. When does the other side, whatever that is, have to do that? I've been there too. So if you're in any of those things and have had any of those feel, feels, I want to leave you with Paul's words from Galatians chapter 6, verse 9 and 10, when he says this, let us not become weary in doing good. Let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. And the family of believers said, amen. The point is to do something. Do something. When it comes to justice, God calls us to go beyond words to actions. 
And here's the really cool part about all of that. When we do something for the least of these, we show just a little bit of the kingdom of heaven right here on earth. We get to give the world a preview of amazing things to come where the Lord returns and sets everything right. Every time we use our voice and our influence to stand up against the injustices in our world, we are showing people a little taste of heaven. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine and a God who loves them enough to want to set things right. Biblical justice is not an option. It's more than just words on a page or on a screen. It leads us to action. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much. Thank you so much for your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you that your name is just. That at the very core of who you are, you are a loving and a righteous and a just God, and we can have hope and faith and trust that one day you will return and set things right. But God, you have given us something to do. You have called us to advocate for the least of these in our communities, in our cultures, in our world. God, help us break our hearts for what breaks yours in this world. God, you gave us an answer and sent your son. We have the answer and the hope the world's looking for. We want to be on the right side of justice, of biblical justice. Help us to pursue that in our daily lives. It's in your son's precious and holy name we pray. Good morning. Now is a time for you to grab your elements uh, in the room here or online. Uh, Grab your elements. And as uh, Phil's talking about justice, it reminded me this week I was in a class and we were studying... Uh, an issue of justice, um, domestic violence. And we were given an assignment to put together our plan to address domestic violence. And so I dove in. I made my list of stuff to watch out for, things to to do, things to take care of. And then we we took this to class and we got broken into groups and I'm with my partner and we're kind of sharing and he shares his element. And his element is, first of all, I'm going to start with prayer and then I'm going to do some of these other things I'm going to end with prayer. And I went, oh my word. I can't believe that I missed that. Prayer, a pause, a conversation with God. And the reason that's so important when we approach this issue of justice is because God is the only one who truly knows what justice looks like. He's really the only one that that he has no shiftiness about him. He has no agenda. He is pure justice. He is pure making things right. And so when we approach communion, it's important for us to take that moment to pause, to ask him. See, what happens is when um, justice, when when we go off and, and think we know what's right and we think we know what needs to be done and we think we know how to fix the problem, we can end up hurting rather than helping. And so as we approach communion, I want to encourage you to take a moment to pause and to ask God, Where in my own life do I need justice? Where in my own life do I need things to be made right? Where in those around me and the things that I'm involved in, where does that, where does there need to be a making right? See, communion is a remembrance of the ultimate act of justice, the ultimate act of making it right. At school, we talk about this idea when we're doing reflection on problems that we have to address we actually have this idea of what we call not what is the right thing, but what is the most redemptive thing. And so as we consider moving toward action, that we pause and we ask God, what is the most redemptive thing? What is the making it right? How can I join you in doing that in myself and in those around me? Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this message. We thank you so much that you, through Jesus, made it right. That you have made a way for us to be made right. You have made a way for us to um, be able to uh, think and speak words, but also to, to provide action to the world around us. Father, let us not run ahead of you, but let us seek you to be re- redemptive in our actions to ourselves and to the world around us, to our family, to our friends, to our coworkers, 
to those that we uh, meet in at a Starbucks or in the store. Lord, let us be givers of redemption. We trust this to you today in Jesus' name. Amen. sounded like mumbling like she was out of her mind she said boys kind of praying is what saved my life you ought to try it sometime and now I know she was right she was talking to Jesus she was talking to Jesus She'd been talking to Jesus for all of her life. Mama used to drag me to church Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights. Khaki pants and a polo shirt. God knows I put up a fight. She said, son, one day you'll thank me for having God in your life And yeah, I know she was right Yeah, my mama was right Cause now I'm talking to Jesus She got me talking to Jesus She got me talking to Jesus Yeah, my mama was right Cause now I'm talking to Jesus yeah, I love talking to Jesus, and I'll be talking to Jesus for the rest of my life. What a friend we have in Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus. Whoa. What a friend we have in Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus. Whoa. He'll say, Daddy, what you doing? I say, Son, I'm talking to God. He'll say, 
Can you help me, Father? I say, just stand by me now. And we'll start talking to Jesus. And yeah, we'll start talking to Jesus. We'll both start talking to Jesus. Whoa, whoa. Then he'll start talking to Jesus. I hope he's talking to Jesus. Yeah, he's talking to Jesus for the rest of his life. And what a friend we have in Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus. Whoa, whoa. What a friend we have in Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus. Whoa. In response to, would you stand with us, friends? Let's sing. There's a grace when the heart is undivided. Another way when the walls are closing in. And when I look at the space between where I used to be and this reckoning, I know I will never be alone. Because there was another in the fire standing next to me. set free there's a cross that bears the burden there is another died for me there is another in the fire oh Jesus all my dead left for dead beneath the waters I'm no longer a slave to my sin All in the space between what remains of me and this reckoning. Either way, I won't bow to the things of this world. I know I will never be alone. There is another in the fire standing next to me. There is another in the water. Should I ever need reminding of what power set me free? There is a grave that holds nobody. Now that power lives in me. And there is another in the fire.
Would you join me in prayer? Father, we are in your presence today. We thank you for your spirit that moves in this place and at home. We thank you for your son who gives us the example we needed for so long. And Father, we ask that you help us to continue that journey moving forward. That we don't leave that relationship here in this space, in this building, but we can go out into the world and we are reminded that your son is walking with us every step of the way and that he is the embodiment of your justice and also your grace and your mercy and your love which endures forever and ever. And Father, we are so humbled by you and we just thank you. Let us be a beacon of hope and love to others around us let us be the example you want us to be in this life. In your son's wonderful name, we all said, amen. Amen. Thank you all so much for joining us online as well. If God puts something on your heart you want to share, our care team is right out there. They'd love to hear from you. You can just share right there. God bless you all. Have a wonderful week.